organic, unpredictable, unknown, lovely, beautiful, a sense of fulfillment. This is part of the pleasures of life and not the chores of life. Coming up on Daily Iowa TV, rising from the floodwaters, see how Iowa City is improving one area in town. I'll take an in-depth look at what it takes to become homecoming king or queen at the University of Iowa. Plus in sports, we're talking Hawkeye defense after an, impress after an impressive display over Minnesota. That's all coming your way next. Daily Iowa TV starts now. I'm Tom Brokaw. For more than 100 years now, the University of Iowa community has been waking up to the Daily Iowa. Today, it's the largest newsroom in eastern Iowa. And now, you can see the news every night on Daily Iowan TV and get it anytime worldwide at dailyiowan.com. Thanks for tuning in to your Monday edition of Daily Iowan TV. I'm Nicole Meehan. And I'm Rebecca Hager. A recently released set of public safety statistics known as the Cleary Report shows a significant increase in liquor law violations between 2009 and 2011 at the University of Iowa. In 2009, officials reported a total of 127 violations. In 2010, that number dropped up to 561 and last year, 497 violations occurred on campus. Some other categories that saw a less drastic increase include aggregated, aggravated assault, motor vehicle theft, and drug abuse violations. The 2008 flood destroyed many areas of Iowa City, but in one area it has also allowed the city to recreate itself. Since the flood, the city has been researching an area south of downtown to include a new park and apartments. On Monday, the city released its plans for a new riverfront crossing. The new crossing will be located on the corner of Benton and Riverside Drive and will extend north along the river. The 278-acre zone would be filled with apartments, commercial buildings, and potentially a new railway system. On Monday, the city held an open house at the, at the, on the issue at Emma Harvest Hall. Officials have yet to release construction dates for the project. The week of homecoming festivities are now a part of the past. But for the king and queen of the UI's 2012 homecoming celebration, the memories will last for years to come. Daily Iowan TV's Brad Maxwell takes a closer look at two special students and their path to royalty. 100 years of spirit, pride, and royalty. Far different than your standard well, high school right homecoming. Voting process, it's not based on popularity at all, it's based on merit, dedication to service, your scholarship, your studies, and the community. Values instead of popularity. Community instead of self. These are a few qualities that characterize the UI's centennial homecoming king and queen. And both parties agree their college homecoming experience provides a much different sense of satisfaction. In college it's just so much more, you know, you're so much more mature and you've had such an opportunity in college to make change, impactful change, you know, positive change. Um, to, and so to be recognized for that kind of stuff is a real honor. Receiving the crown as king or queen of homecoming is a unique honor that few get to experience. But with over 30,000 students attending the University of Iowa, what sets these two students apart from the rest of the student body? The process to distinguish these elite students starts off with submitting an application, two letters of recommendation, and responses to five essay questions. From there, 10 women and 10 men are selected, interviewed, and judged to determine who stands out as the UI's homecoming king and queen. What set me apart um, from the students on court or from maybe the other applicants was just that I'm so passionate about the writing community here and it's, uh, it's just such an amazing thing that I feel like is constantly creatively stimulating me. I try to participate in stuff as much as possible in a positive way and um, you know just Hawkeye for life. And their sense of Hawkeye pride shine through the cherished memories of their homecoming experience. For sure, hearing my name announced in Kinnick Stadium, that was surreal. If you told my, you know, 10-year-old self that you're going to be on the Jumbotron as a senior in college, I would have hit myself and said, quit lying to me. So although the homecoming festivities have concluded, the memories of the 2012 homecoming king and queen will be cherished for years to come. Brad Maxwell, Daily Iowa TV. Still to come on Daily Iowa TV, patchwork farming. 
See how the summer's drought had a different effect on the autumn crop. And in sports, we're going around the UI sports facilities in our Monday evening whip around. But first, let's go to Anna for a look at our weather forecast. Thanks, Rebecca. It's the first day of October, and it's starting to look a lot like fall on campus. There were cooler temps during the day, which will continue into the night with a low of 49 degrees. Looking to tomorrow, we will see things warm up just a little bit more with temps starting at 59 degrees. The afternoon will warm up a lot more, settling in at 73 degrees, but the clouds will stick around a lot like Monday. We will end the day with a high 50s, making for a chilly night. Then, taking a look at the rest of the week, Wednesday will be the high point with the temps reaching 79 degrees. Your week gets colder from there with Thursday in the mid-60s. And as we approach the weekend temperatures, we will see 50s for the first time this year. But despite the cooler temps, the sun should be shining for most of the week. That's all for your weather update. Back to you guys at the desk. This year's drought was one of the worst Iowa has ever seen. And it's no secret that Iowa's agricultural industry took a hit. One crop that swings into popularity this time of year has had mixed results from the drought. Iowa City's two pumpkin patches have recorded very different results following the abnormally dry summer. Wilson's Orchard, which is northeast of Iowa City, saw the best year they have had in a long time. The owners said they believe the drought didn't affect growth at all, but helped the pests and keep the disease down. Honey Creek Acres, located between Iowa City and Cedar Rapids, said this year's yield, yields dropped 50% due to the drought. Experts from Iowa State University are not surprised by the mixed results. They say it's because of the rain. It was commonly inconsistent across the state, and that some farmers will have better results than others. And now it's time to take a look at what's going on outside of Iowa City. The Swedish furniture company IKEA is facing backlash after the release of its most recent catalog. The world-famous company removed all women from Saudi Arabian catalog. Officials made the decision based on a Saudi censorship laws, but have since pulled back on their choice. IKEA released a statement saying they should not have excluded women from the edition because it conflicts with the IKEA group values. The company is now reviewing policies to safeguard against future incidents. And court is in session. The United States Supreme Court opened its new term on Monday. It was the first time the justices had been in session since the controversial case that upheld President Barack Obama's Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. The first case that the High Court will be hearing is a human rights case concerning Royal Dutch Petroleum and their cooperation with the views of Nigerian citizens. Although the case has very little connection to the United States, human rights groups say it's an important step in human rights legislation. And finally, meat lovers around the world rejoice because bacon is back on the menu. In response to this summer's drought, rumors spread of a global bacon shortage. But U.S. agriculture economists say that that is baloney. Many pork meat suppliers say there will be less of the meat, but nothing to be considered a major shortage. However, the drought will cause prices of the popular meat to go up in the near future. And now it's time to take a look at Hawkeye Sports with Yovana Simic. Hello and welcome back to the Daily Iowa TV Sports Studio, where we once again have a lot to get you caught up in the world of Hawkeye Sports. The University of Iowa football team was clicking on all cylinders on offense this past Saturday, bringing home Florida Ro Rosedale for the first time in three years. Daily Iowa and TV sports reporter Lauren Moss tells us why the black and gold defense may have been the, most, the more impressive group Saturday and could continue to be moving forward. Minnesota was without their starting quarterback Marquise Gray this past weekend, and Iowa's defense had a field day with his replacement, Max Shortell. Iowa came out to play Minnesota just the way they needed to this past homecoming weekend. Iowa's offense and defense seemed to be spot on, holding the Gophers to only 13 points. The defense was able to completely shut down any hopes for Minnesota's second-line quarterback, Max Shortell. Minnesota's usual starting back, Marquise Gray, was forced to sit out due to an high ankle sprain. With their starting man out, Iowa was able to keep Shortell on the turf. We moved on. One game wasn't going to make our season. We're in Big Ten play now, and we had to move on to a tough Minnesota team. And uh, we had a good week of practice, good week of preparation, and it showed on the field. 
the Hawkeye defensive line is, as head coach Kirk Ferentz emphasized once again post-game, a quote, young and hard-working group, end quote. And this weekend, that hard work paid off. The Golden Gophers left Kinnick Stadium with their first tallied loss this season, leaving Hawkeye's defense to be the dominating topic. We get a lot of pressure. You know, they did a good job. Everyone did a good job. From, you know, D-line, the linebackers, the defensive backs, you know, we played a good game. Eight University of Iowa defensive linemen rotated into Saturday's 31-13 victory against Minnesota, which resulted in fresh legs being able to outrace short tail on the Gophers. Minnesota coach Jerry Kill said, quote, we need Marquise back badly, end quote. Whether or not if Gray would have played, the Iowa defense proved that they're out to win. From Daily Iowa TV Sports, Lauren Moss. All right, thanks, Lauren. And now it's time for our weekly Monday evening whip around, where reporters in the field have been working hard to get you caught up on everything black and gold from the past weekend. Daily Iowa and TV sports reporter Chelsea Brown kicks off our coverage from Carver Hawkeye Arena. Chelsea? Hey, guys. I'm reporting outside of Carver Hawkeye Arena, giving you the latest update on the Iowa women's volleyball team. This past weekend, they finally got to play at home in Carver as they matched up against Michigan and number 24th ranked Michigan State. The Hawkeyes unfortunately fell in straight sets against both Michigan and Michigan State this weekend. On Friday's game against the Wolverines, during the second set, the Hawkeyes were able to tie it up 13-13 after the Wolverine lead. As Mich Michigan came back, the Hawkeyes rallied to make the score 24-21, but a service error from the Hawkeyes gave the visitors their second set victory. Michigan won the third set 25-20 to, to complete their victory over the Hawks. Then on Saturday, the Hawkeyes matched up against 24th ranked Michigan State. The Hawkeyes fell in the first two sets, but came out swinging in the third set, leading 11-6, to even forcing a Spartan timeout. The two teams rallied back and forth, but unfortunately the visitors came out with the final victory with a close set of 25-22. to The Iowa Hawkeyes do return to Big Ten action this week as they head to Indiana. The Iowa Hawkeyes will face Indiana on Friday and number 13th ranked Purdue on Saturday. Now we'll turn it over to Annie Costable with more on the cross country team. I'm here at the UI Rec where the Hawkeye cross country teams just returned from the Roy Griak Invitational at the University of Minnesota. The men had an impressive sixth place finish and were led by junior John Michael Brandt who recorded a time of 25-20 to finish 24th overall. Both the men's and women's cross country teams return to action October 12th. Now we kick it to Kate Constable at the UI Soccer Complex to get an update on the women's soccer team. Kate? Thanks, Annie. I'm here at the UI Soccer Complex, and things didn't go quite as planned for the UI women's soccer team or in a manner that they're used to. The Hawks battled through 110 minutes of play and two overtime periods this weekend before ending in a draw against Michigan and Michigan State on the road. The Hawks allowed only one shot on goal Friday night against the Wolverines and two shots on goal during that overtime period. On the contrary, the Hawks finished the game with 13 shots, and despite a header that sailed just over the top of the Wolverines' goal, Iowa didn't get many, too many good looks, resulting in a 0-0 tie. On Sunday, Iowa goalkeeper Meg Goodson recorded four saves, extending her shutout streak to 197 minutes without a goal. That's all for us here in the field, wrapping up our Monday evening edition of Whip Around. I'm Kate Constable, Daily Iowa TV. All right, thanks, ladies. Excellent reporting. That's all for us here in sports. Be sure to tune in tomorrow as we kick off our first feature week of the year and bring in Daily Iowa and field, ho field Hockey beat reporter Cody Goodwin to discuss the 11th-ranked Field Hawks. Back to you at the desk. And only with Daily Iowan TV can you get a sneak peek at tomorrow's edition of the Daily Iowan. Read about how Arab students will be voting in the upcoming election and learn about an initiative to make Chinese literature more available to the University of Iowa students. That's your latest edition of Daily Iowan TV. Be sure to check us out tomorrow or anytime online at dailyiowantv.com. Thanks for watching and have a great night.